Chapter 7, Slides 1 through 10. So this is going to be our first real chapter doing organic chemistry. Uh, technically, we did do the radical halogenation last chapter, and we're going to build off of that. But this is going to be um, a reaction that we're, a mechanism type that we're going to be using quite a bit from now until the end of organic two. Now, so we have to take uh, the, the radical chemistry that we just learned and put it aside because uh, using radical chemistry mechanisms, you know, where you're pushing one electron at a time with um, only single barbed arrows, in this course and the next, we're really only going to be using that radical mechanism 5% of the time or less. Had, uh, pushing electrons as a pair is more likely what we'll be doing in the greater than 90% of the time. So we're going to mark this as one of the most substantial chapters uh, for understanding general mechanisms. We're going to start with the functional group called the alkyl halides. What you're going to notice is that from now until the end of organic 2, we're going to introduce a new functional group to you, and we're going to look at that functional group from a physical property standpoint, and then we're going to look at how we can synthesize molecules bearing that functional group, and then we're going to talk about that functional group being the starting material and what we can do with that functional group, like what reactions can we do. So let's begin. Alkyl halides. We see alkyl halides in lots of different types of molecules out there. You know, we might see them in insecticides like DDT, which has lots of chlorines in it. And you might think, oh, well, having halogens is going to be something that's um, toxic all the time, which isn't the case. Uh, for example, food additives like Splenda or sucralose is very similar to sucrose, sugar, but they replaced three of the uh, alcohols with chlorines, and we can ingest that. Um, dyes, like Tyrian purple, has a couple bromines in it. And, you know, lots of drugs out in the market will have strategically placed uh, halogens in it. So halogens uh, may be part of synthetic molecules that serve us, or they might be part of natural compounds that you find, or part of molecules that um, are not toxic that help to serve us. So they have a variety of different uh, uh, usefulness out in the world. So we see them a lot. And again, alkyl halides are carbons that have some halogen on it. And we're talking more specifically in this venue about chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Physical properties of alkyl halides. Well, if you just have a simple alkyl a molecule and a halogen on it because yes you have a dipole there is a partially positive carbon and a partially negative halogen makes for a dipole however there's no hydrogen bonding capability the halogen the chlorine the bromine the iodine doesn't have a, a hydrogen off of it so it doesn't have hydrogen bonding interactions it does have a dipole but when you compare it to other organic molecules that have maybe other stronger dipoles or hydrogen bonding capability, I would rank boiling points of typical alkyl halides as low. However, if you just looked at the general trend and you were comparing an alkyl fluoride to an alkyl chloride to an alkyl all the way up to iodide, what you would find is that the boiling points increase as you go so iodide alkyl iodides have a greater boiling point than bromine alkyl bromides have a greater boiling point than alkyl chlorides why is that well it's not due so much to the dipole as it is to the size so as you're increasing the size from say chlorine to iodine right iodine is a bigger a bigger atom you're increasing the van der Waals forces. So there's more surface area, so there's more van der Waals forces um, holding one molecule to another, and, and so that's why we see the boiling points increase, typically. How about densities? Well, alkyl halides tend to have um, densities depending upon the, 
the halogen that's present and also the number of halogens present. So if you have an alkyl halide and it only contains you know, one fluorine or one chlorine, then it's going to be less dense than water. But if you start increasing the halogen to say bromine or iodine, or you add two chlorines, so you guys in lab have been working with something called dichloromethane. And when you use dichloromethane, what you'll find, because it has two chlorines, is that it is more dense than water. It's just over one cubic centimeters. So that's a little bit on the properties of basic, you know, typical run-of-the-mill type simple alkyl halides. The next thing, after we cover these physical properties, what we want to discuss is how we can make these guys. Well, let's consider the only reaction really, other than acid-base chemistry, the only reaction we really looked at was something like this. One bromoethane. Okay, we know how to make that. We could start with ethane and introduce Br2 and light, right? So chapter six actually showed us how to make alkyl halides. Now it has its limitations, right? It's very difficult to have regioselective halogenation, meaning if you have a very big complex molecule and you want to put the bromine in a very specific place, you may or may not get what you want. There are massive limitations, as we saw, depending upon the stability of the radical, uh, the stereochemistry that you can get. And as you know, if you have a really large molecule and there are multiple areas uh, for tertiary radical formation, then you might not get the one specific location you want. But, you know, we do have a way to make alkyl halides. We, we've already covered it. So now what I want to do is specifically use some terminology that we've already used, the alkyl halide versus allylic halide versus vinyl halide. So what I want you to do is take a moment and identify in the following molecules which halides are alkyl or vinyl, and specifically the ones that are alkyl, if you could label them as allylic or not. So I'm going to use my yellow marker and I'm going to label all of the alkyl halides in yellow. So the alkyl halides are going to be in yellow. There's an alkyl halide. B is actually a vinyl halide because the halogen's on a vinyl carbon, it's on a double bonded carbon. You can see that the chlorines down in E are all vinyl. The bromine in G is vinyl as well. The remaining halogens are on tetrahedral alkyl positions. Okay. So I have now determined which ones are alkyl, which ones are on sp3 carbons. I have also determined which ones of the above are vinyl halides on sp2 carbons. Now I'm going to just add the distinction of the alkyl halides, which ones are, are allylic, which ones are next door to a pi bond. A is not, B is vinyl, C doesn't have any pi bonds in it, D, oh yes, this is allylic. So that is specifically, so it is an alkyl halide, but more specifically, it's an allylic alkyl halide. F 
does not have any double bonds in it. And H, also, it does have a double bond, but the allylic position is not where the halogen is. So the only allylic one is D. Why do we care? Well, the chemistry that we're going to be learning, called substitution chemistry, will only work on sp3 carbons that contain the halogen. Okay, so halogens are going to be our functional group, and the chemistry that we're going to cover does not work on vinyl halides. Okay, so you've got to make sure that if you see in a vinyl halide and someone's trying to do a substitution reaction, you can ignore that one. That's not going to do any chemistry. You've got to pay strict attention to the alkyl halides that are sp3 carbons. So now what I want to do is I want to take those alkyl halides, like A, and I want to look at their dipole. So for all the alkyl halides, let's indicate the partial positive and partial negative parts of that system. So for A, the carbon is partially positive and the bromine is partially negative because of that dipole, right? It's a dipole. So sometimes you'll see me draw it as the arrow with the dipole arrow, or you can just, you know, indicate that those carbons have a dipole by using the partial, that partial sign, okay? And we can do the same for C. The carbon is partially, carbon is partially positive, the bromine is partially negative. For D, the carbon is partially positive, the chlorine is partially negative. For F, the carbon is partially positive, the fluorine is partially negative. And lastly, for H, the iodide is partially negative and the carbon is partially positive. So what you'll notice is that the alkyl halides represent a molecule with a dipole. So therefore, there's one area of the molecule that's partially positive and one area, the halogen, that's partially negative. This is what sets us up for a reaction. Reactions are only going to occur between atoms that are attracted to one another. And attraction is based on charges, right? A negative to a positive. So this is going to set us up for reactivity which is the name of the game, right? Now, before we do this, uh, before we move forward on all of the mechanisms we're gonna cover throughout the course, I need to make a few more definitions clear. We're gonna be using a word called electrophile and nucleophile. Now, let's talk about what these are. An electrophile is going to be an atom, and it's often for us, it's not always, but the atom is often going to be a carbon that is partially negative or formal charge carbocation, like positive charge, okay? So an electrophile is a positively charged or partial positively charged atom. Often it's gonna be carbon, but an electrophile is not an H. Okay, specifically an atom, but not a hydrogen. Any other atom that's partially positive or full-on positive is going to be an electrophile. Now, this term electrophile means electron lover, right? Electro meaning electron, file meaning lover. So it's an electron lover. And you're positively charged if you love electrons, right? You want them to fill that hole. So electrophiles have a positive nature to them but they're not hydrogens. Why? Well, we already have a specific word for hydrogens that are positive or partially positive, and that's called an acid. An acid is specifically an H plus donor, or an, an, um, a molecule that has a hydrogen that's very electropositive, right? An atom, specifically hydrogen, that's electropositive or full-on positive, okay? So electrophiles and acids, they're kind of the same. It's just that acids are a type of electrophile that's very, very specific, meaning it's a hydrogen. 
a nucleophile. A nucleophile is an atom that is partially negative or full on negative. Okay, now you could argue that a base is also an atom that has a partial negative or full on negative. So what distinguishes a nucleophile from a base? Well, a nucleophile or nucleus lover, think about the name nucleo and phile, right? Nucleo is nucleus and phile meaning lover. Nucleus, the nucleus of an atom is positive. So if you love the positive nucleus, then you must be negative from an attraction standpoint. So a nucleophile is an atom that's partially negative or negative that reacts with not hydrogen. <laughs> you like the way I said that? Well, a base is an atom that's partially negative or negative that reacts with a hydrogen, with an acid, right? So acids and bases are very specific terms. They're very specific electrophile, nucleophile interactions because it deals with a proton being sort of the giver and the base being the negative or partial negative species that takes, okay? We're gonna see the same exact thing with electrophiles and nucleophiles, but we're not going to be exchanging hydrogens. That's, that's a very specific case we call acid-base chemistry. Electrophile nucleophiles is when you have an atom, typically, you know, some atom that has a partial negative. So let's say here, I've got a up at the top here. All right, I'm gonna color code this. We've got a nucleophile. So here's my nucleophile. Let's say the nucleophile is negatively charged, okay? If you have an alkyl halide, the carbon is partially positive and the halogen is partially negative. We set that up in the previous slide. So the nucleophile, which if it's, if the nucleophile is negatively charged, all I need is a partial positive to be attracted to. And what you're gonna find is that the nucleophile will substitute in for the halogen. So now the nucleophile is on my carbon-based species and the halogen left as the negatively charged species. So this is at the top here. This is a very general way of writing a very general way of writing a substitution reaction. We're gonna get more specific though in this chapter, okay? There's a lot more to it. So just to give you a very ex um, specific example of, what, of defining electrophile and nucleophile versus acids and bases, I just wanna show you that there's a fine line between a base and a nucleophile. They can actually be the same species. So let's say I purchased sodium hydroxide. Okay, sodium hydroxide, Na plus OH minus. I've got a strong nucleophile. Why? Because it has a negative charge. So there's my OH minus. That OH minus is gonna take its electrons and it's going to make a bond with the carbon and the bromine is going to leave it's going to be, the so basically the OH is gonna substitute in for the bromine. But I want you to pay strict attention to what bond was being made. The OH minus, which was my nucleophile, attacked the electropositive carbon, the alkyl bromide carbon, because of the dipole. Negative to positive, okay? So I would call the OH minus, the NaOH in this particular ex uh, example, is acting like a nucleophile. Okay, look at the second example. I'm gonna use the same species, Na plus OH minus. But instead of methyl bromide, I'm gonna react it with hydrogen bromide. Now, 
I have an electropositive hydrogen. And we have done this chemistry. We have taken the oxygen with its extra lone pair of electrons, and we made a bond with the hydrogen, and then we kicked off the bromine. This is the base, and this is the acid. And you end up with the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. So I want you to take a look at these two. They're very similar. Look at the electron pushing for it. Very, very similar. But we've defined them differently because of the bonds being made. Here, I've made a new bond to carbon in that first case. And I the OH- minus was making a new bond with the carbon. It wasn't taking off a hydrogen. So therefore, we're going to define them differently. So just think about it that way. A base, though, a base and a nucleophile, they're kind of the same. It's just we define them based on how they behave. Okay. There are two very specific types of substitution reactions that we're going to cover in this chapter. And it's worth noting, and I'll bring it up at the, the last set of slides, these two can be in competition with each other. So in some cases, SN2 substitution will prevail, and in other cases, SN1 type mechanisms will prevail. So I already showed you the general um, reaction, if you will, of a nucleophile, right, nucleophile interacting with an alkyl halide. to make a new bond with the, between the nucleophile. Basically substitutes, you know, the nucleophile is now onto the carbon and the halogen has been kicked off. So you're substituting one thing for another, okay? Now, as I mentioned, these substitution reactions, because of um, the alignment with the antibonding orbital, or the, the back lobe, sorry, the back lobe of the sp3 orbital, is the only one that you can use to do this reaction. So some of these you've seen, some of them you haven't. Which molecules will be able to undergo a substitution reaction? Okay, so if I draw a tetrahedral carbon with a halogen off of it, let's say chlorine, and I were to represent the carbon as the orbital. Here's the orbital overlapping the orbital of the chlorine. Understand that that carbon chlorine bond, it's all about the orbitals that we're attacking. And so for alkyl systems, we need the leaving group, the chlorine, to be on an sp3 carbon. So I don't want you to even consider the vinyl halogens for any for undergoing any of these substitution reactions. You just can't get the uh, the correct alignment of the orbitals interacting with the nucleophile. So the answer of the ones that we're showing you, the ones that can undergo substitution reaction are a alkyl C, D, H, and that's it. F doesn't even have a halogen on it, so you can't do a substitution. And B, E, and G all have vinyl halogens, which cannot undergo substitution reactions. So there you go. That's the first step, identifying molecules that can undergo these types of reactions. Okay, so now let's talk about our first substitution reaction. We're going to look at the SN2 reaction first. What I'd like you to do is start a collection of flashcards. And these flashcards are on the front. So this is the front of your flashcard. Just to write a very simple um, representation of an SN2 reaction. So I'm giving you a very simplistic one. 
On the back, I don't want you to write the product because I don't want this to be a memorize the product type of uh, exercise. I want this to be an I understand what, what mechanism to employ, okay? It would be like saying a flashcard would be two plus five. I don't want the answer on the back to be seven. I want the answer on the back to be addition. I want you to recognize that that plus symbol when I write two plus five is an addition equation and that that's the answer is I have to apply addition to this in order to work out the product. Okay, I don't want there to be um, the answer. Why? Because every reaction I give you, it's going to be different. I'm going to have a different starting material for you. I'm going to have a different nucleophile for you. So what's the point in memorizing every permutation of SN2? Learn to recognize when to apply an SN2 and then calculate your answer. Okay? I want you to do this for all of the chemistry that we're going to be learning in the next three or four chapters. So I'll when you see these squares with the back side, like this is the back of, these are representing how I want you to make your flashcards, okay? All right, now let's talk about the mechanism. I'll use this molecule as an example. And I'm just going to show you how things flow, how the electrons go from start to finish. And I can be very specific. So I'll use sodium hydroxide since that's what I used on the previous slide. So the first thing to note, okay, these key points down at the bottom, is that it's a concerted mechanism. It means that it all happens in one shot. A concerted mechanism means no intermediate. You can already start thinking up this energy diagram, right? And the other thing is, is it's a, it's a backside attack. So what's happening here is that the leaving group, which is the bromine, the alkyl halide is serving as our leaving group. The bromine is a, is a good leaving group. We're gonna talk about what makes a good leaving group, but all alkyl halides are good leaving groups. We already know that the carbon is partially positive. We know that the sodium hydroxide is an ionic system and the oxygen is full on negative. Now I'm going to put a little note here for you. If you are looking at a reaction and you're trying to figure out what to do, if you see a negative charge, a formal negative charge, formally negative, not partially negative, formal negative, that's where you start your pen. Negative charges are atoms that have extra electron density, and man, they are searching hard to use their electron pair to make a bond. That is the source of the, of the urgency, okay? So when you see a negative charge, start your pencil or your pen on that lone pair. So effectively, we've got an OH minus, which means that oxygen is negatively charged because it has an extra lone pair. It really wants to use that lone pair, so let's use it. Take that lone pair, that extra one, and make a bond with the partially positive carbon. So there's your bond making, and as that bond is forming, carbon can only have four bonds, right? And it, remember, it does have a back hydrogen right now. So of all the bonds, the weakest bond is the one between the carbon and the bromine because that greedy bromine is pulling the electron density towards it and is going to break this bond. So the bond of the carbon bromine will break. So incoming, outgoing happens at the exact same time. It, I always think it's like an elevator, a two-door elevator, SN2, a two-door elevator. Do you ever go someplace in Disney World or... Um, some, I don't know, tourist attraction where they're trying to get the tourists in and out really efficiently and quickly. And they have those fancy two-door elevators, right? Both doors open up 
and the incoming tourist group and the group that's getting off the elevator, that can happen in one flow. In and out happens sort of in one direction and the, the on and off the elevator can happen at the same time. A concerted mechanism, on and off happens at the same time. So we're going to end up with, in this particular case, oops, now don't be too concerned about the stereochemistry yet. We're going to talk about that. What I want you to pay attention to are the red arrows. That's your mechanism. That's your electron pushing mechanism. Bond making, bond breaking. What happened to the bromine? Oh, the bromine's out and around there. Now the bromine is negatively charged. But consider the reaction. OH minus reacted. Bromine is a great leaving group, right? Things are happier on the other side of the arrow. Why? Think about ARIO. We're dealing with negative charges here. Ario says we swapped out an O minus for a Br minus. So this reaction is going to go in that direction because the Br minus we formed is much happier. The atom is more greedy, more electronegative than the O minus, and so that's the direction the SN2 reaction works. I'll get to this backside attack inversion in, in a little bit. Here's another sort of way to look at it. We've got the NaOH, right? the extra lone pairs on the oxygen. And what it's doing is it's making this new bond from the back of the carbon and popping the bromine off. This bond making, bond breaking, arrow pushing, is shown in the transition state because understand that the oxygen minus has to approach this carbon. And as it's approaching, it's electron cloud is bumping into the electron cloud of the carbon. So you have to overcome some electron cloud repulsion to actually get close enough to make that bond. So what's represented in the middle here is the transition state. Using dotted lines to show that one bond is being formed and one bond is being broken. And in the middle here, it kind of goes through this flat, planar carbon species as it inverts to accept the oxygen on the other face. So that's what's meant by backside attack. What's really happening here, and you can see it down here in the space line, um, uh, ball and stick model, is that the carbon, the carbon has the back lobe of its sp3, okay, see this back lobe right here? That back lobe is enlarging and accepting the OH minus as it approaches. So the OH, the oxygen orbital, is going to overlap with that little back orbital of the carbon. So that in the end, the oxygen makes a new bond with that. So it enlarges, it almost like inverts. So the back lobe is now the bonding lobe and the bromine goes off. So you need that that back lobe in order for the OH to simultaneously overlap with while the bromine lets go and it inverts. So given this, this is a one-step concerted mechanism. Let's consider why it's called SN2. Well, the word, the name SN2 comes from the fact that the S stands for substitution. The N stands for nucleophilic. And the 2 stands for second order. It's a second order reaction. What does that mean? Well, when the rate of these reactions were studied, okay, in order to understand more about what was happening kinetically with this, this reaction, the rate was determined to be both reliant on the concentration of the nucleophile, right? And remember, the nucleophile is the NaOH in this case, 
And it was also immediately related to the electrophile. So the nucleophile is the concentration of NaOH, and the electrophile was the concentration of the alkyl halide. And so what this meant, and so what they what they did is they increased, and these were raised to the order of one, meaning they ran this reaction and they, they increased the concentration of the nucleophile. So they added more NaOH. And what they found was that the rate was directly proportional to the increase in concentration. So if I double the concentration of the nucleophile, the rate doubles. The rate of this reaction doubles. So they knew that it was dependent upon the concentration of the nucleophile. So then what they did is they doubled, they ran the reaction again and they doubled the concentration of the electrophile or triple it and do whatever you want. Double, triple, have it, um, double the concentration of the electrophile. And what they found was that the rate doubled. They could triple the concentration of the electrophile and the rate triples. So there's a direct correlation. So when there's a direct correlation, they get it to the power of one. When you add up these coefficients up here, you get two, one plus one is two. It means that both the electrophile and the nucleophile play a role in the rate from a concentration standpoint. The rate is directly affected by them. That's where the second order comes in because there's two, both the nucleophile and the electrophile, both of them, two play a, rate, uh, a role in the rate. How does this come out looking like in an energy diagram? Well, as I mentioned, there's a transition state. There's a high energy point you have to overcome. The two molecules have to overcome electron repulsion clouds to get close to one another to bond. So you have a starting material, and then you have to overcome some energy to get to a product. So this is what an SN2 reaction probably looks like. No intermediate, transition state to get from point A to point B. One step, concerted reaction. How might we represent this using ASL? All right, now let's talk about that inversion or the backside attack key point. The fact that the incoming and outgoing have to happen not in each other's way, right? But you have to use that back lobe of the orbital to bond with. This is going to make an effect if I have a stereocenter. Let's take this uh, molecule to begin with, this 2-bromobutane. If I were to identify it as an R or an S stereocenter, I would do what I did from chapter five, right? I would say, okay, bromine is one priority, the ethyl is two, and the methyl is three. And I got lucky because the hydrogen, which is four, is in the back already. Yay! So when I go from one to two to three, I see that I'm turning my car to the right. So this is R two bromobutane. When the OH minus attacks 2-bromobutane, so let me, I can draw this a couple different ways. I like to draw it my way. I, I understand the way that we're drawing it over here, but I just want to show you that it doesn't matter. The OH minus, right, take its lone pairs, come in from the back, and kick out the bromine. What you're going to end up with is the hydrogen gets kicked forward and the OH is now in the back. The OH, if the bromine is in the front, what this means is that the OH had to have come in from the back. It's like you're kicking someone from behind, right? You can't kick them from the front and expect them, to, you'll bump into them as they're leaving. So you're coming in from the back. The approach of the OH is from the opposite side of the bromine. Since the bromine is in the front, the OH came in from the back, and then the hydrogen just sort of moves and readjusts as it rehybridizes. 
Okay, so these two molecules as drawn are the same, but the authors decided let's draw it like the one shown here because it'll be easier to figure out R and S. But let's do it our way because I think it's easier to see from my electron pushing perspective. And let's prove to ourselves, oh look, the hydrogen's in the front. So I'm gonna make a note to myself that I'm in the wrong perspective. The oxygen is priority one, the ethyl is priority two, the methyl is priority three, and the hydrogen is priority four. I made a note to say that the lowest priority group is in the wrong perspective relative to me. I'm gonna do one to two to three. That is turning right, but it's S. And you can see that in, in the example given. They drew, these are the same molecules, they just drew it a little differently. But you can see the hydrogens in the back, they drew it from an easier perspective. One, two, three, and then if you turn the wheel, it's turning, indeed, it's turning S. But I like my way. I like this way of representing the approach of the OH. So what I want you to do, and I'm sticking with the same nucleophile just to get you comfortable, okay? It doesn't always have to be NaOH. We're, there's lots of different nucleophiles that we can, we can use. We'll talk about those as we move along. I, right now, I really want to get you comfortable with predicting a product based on the inversion and drawing the mechanism. So let's do this one together. I look at this molecule and I identify the functionality. Aha, there is my alkyl halide right there. And I know that the carbon of an alkyl halide is a great electrophile because of that very strong dipole. I look at the reagents and I ask myself, do I have a strong one? Do I have a strong negative that can attract that pot partial positive? And indeed I do, I have an ionic sodium hydroxide, which means that I'm more interested in the negative oxygen. It's gonna use up one of its lone pairs. and It's going to make a bond with that partially positive carbon. That's where the bond making is happening. And the bond breaking occurs here. That's the mechanism. That's the electron pushing formalism. What does it give me? Well, notice that I didn't touch anything else. I still have a single, um, a six membered ring intact. Did I do anything on the other side of the molecule? No, not that double bond is still there. That methyl that's back, I didn't touch that. My arrows don't tell any story about that changing. What does change is that the bromine is gone as Br minus. That left with the extra set of lone pairs. And the OH is now attached to the carbon. Specifically, it had to have come in from the opposite face of the bromine. And since the bromine's in the front, the OH must have come in from the back. I'll leave these for you guys to try. Some of them have stereochemistry, some of them do not have stereochemistry indicated, but I really want you to focus on writing the mechanism and drawing the major product found for each of these SN2 reactions.